Howdy, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the OKS Trapper Podcast. As always, we are brought to you by Mountain Tough Fitness. And if you go to their website and sign up by using the promo code OKS30, you will get a free 30-day subscription to sweat and suffer with other outdoor enthusiasts. But today's guest is a beast of a human. He looks like he might lift a few weights every once in a while, too. He's a husband, a father, a pilot, a hunter, and a trapper. You've probably seen some of his hunts on Stuck in the Ruts YouTube channel, or if you follow his social media, you'll see he suffers no fools and has even given Donald Trump Jr. a wolf baculum. So ladies and gentlemen, Adam Grenda, the Dick Bone King, welcome to the show. That's quite the intro, dude. I always I always feel really humbled by the intros. I've done a lot of podcasts and stuff, but I'm, I'm not that fancy. Uh, one correction, it was a bear dick bone that I gave oh. to Donald Trump Jr. So, look yeah. at me, Look at me making assumptions here. I just assumed it was just a wolf dick bone, but it's good to know it was a bear. Yeah, nine foot eight brown bear from Alaska. And uh, yeah, whopper, like a nine incher. Wow. Eh, well, I wish I could say the same for me, but I surely can't. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's awesome. So, to kind of get started, I mean, you and I were just going back and forth before this started, so maybe we could start there. You're sweaty right now. What were you just working on, you know, staying true to your trapper form? Well, I feel like an asshole because we were supposed to start about 37 minutes ago, and I'm a pretty big time Nazi. Um, but I had to flip these wolves uh, on the board for people who don't know. Like, a lot of trapping is putting up fur, and there's uh, – an art to it and it's time sensitive on, on how long stuff dries to when it can be dry enough to flip and still be pliable and stuff and turn in ears and i kind of had to i put these two wolves up yesterday but then i kind of had to rehydrate some of the ears and different parts so i could flip them you know because the fur was on the inside i want to flip them for on the outside so i can market them and sell them to taxidermists and people want to mount them or buy them for a wall hanger and so yeah but I was sweaty because I had my wood stove on because I have two Wolverine that are frozen that I've scanned that I'm trying to get thawed out so I can put those up and uh, get them sealed because I got those sold already. So I need to get those shipped. Yeah, I, I think there's very few people who can understand the joy and pain of having a wood burning stove in your fur shed, which I do as well. It's you're either fully clothed waiting for it to warm up or you're trying to strip down to nothing just so you don't like pass out from it heat stroke yeah my wife come well my first shed's like the downstairs of my house it's kind of weird i have like the nicest first shed ever um but i try and clean up pretty good afterwards um and get the green belly wolves out as fast as i can but uh she'll come downstairs all the fire ripping i have it dampered down but she's like why is the door open this makes no sense and it's like ptsd from my dad you know like i have a window open on the house and getting your ass beat but i'm like i like the ambiance of the fire and i needed it to help thaw out the fur and now i'm sweating my balls off so i had the door open so leave I me alone I, I thought i was the only one who had their fur shed in the downstairs like literally under in our cabin the downstairs room is my fur shed but uh you know pro or my pro tip one of the things my wife bought me for christmas because she was tired of me getting blood and everything else everywhere and kind of seeping in like the wood floors was a, a little plastic container that you can buy at Home Depot for your uh, water heater, just a round one. So I started putting those under each one of the you know animals I have, and then I can just wipe it out and toss it away. It worked out pretty good, actually. It was her her genius. You know, huh. that worked. Only a you couple send me a, You need to send me a link to that because I've been using uh... – just started using those like they're two feet by two feet. They're called oil diapers to suck up mm -hmm. gas and oil, you know, and it's just like a white eighth inch tampon pretty thing pretty much. But I want to see what you got going on. Yeah, I use that in like a puppy pee pad. It works pretty well. But, you know, for folks who don't know you, Adam, and for me, this is going to be an exploration into your background too. Like, when did you get into trapping? Because, I mean, if you look at your social media, you're doing a whole lot. But where did everything start for you? Was it as a kid? Was it as an adult? When did you first really remember getting into trapping specifically? Oh, I had the, the mouse trap lying out the backyard, you know, like in second grade. I think like all of us probably did. And I'd go check traps before school. It was just a fat little eight-year-old. Mom, oh, I got a mouse, you know. And uh, thought that was pretty cool. Um and was that in Alaska? Is that where you're from? No. Okay. Sorry, that was North Idaho. I was born and raised in North Idaho in Post Falls. And um, 
Yeah, I really didn't get much into it until, man, I was 19. I moved to Southern Idaho. I was living in Blackfoot and I was flying out of Pocatello, getting a commercial license, building up a lot of flight time to get a commercial pilot's license to learn how to fly and not kill myself and take passengers. And um, there's a lot of bad weather days and it was winter time. And so I started running some snares and I mean, I was calling coyotes, but I was like, man, they're just, they're going crazy at night. And I'm down at this game reserve place where you could trap. And there was just coyote sign and trails everywhere. And at night it would just go lights out. And so I started setting snares, knew nothing about it. Got on Trapper Man. I spent a lot of time on Trapper Man. Um, met with a local dude. Uh, gave me like a dozen snares to start. And uh, just, yeah, I think my first six weeks trapping ever, I snared like, I don't know, nine or ten coyotes. I thought that was pretty good. Coyotes are smart. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just learned to set on sign. And it was it was really cool. But, I mean, total full immersion from not knowing how to skin a coyote to putting fur up and just everything. It was nuts. That's awesome. So with that, like coming from up north, coming down for flying to get your commercial license, where did that love of flying come from? Because, you know, according to social media, if anybody follows you, you're only good at trapping and hunting because you have a plane. Uh, exactly. Yep. But it sounds like you were kind of doing the hunting and obviously starting trapping at the same time. So jokes aside, but where did the love of flying come from? Was that always in pursuit of doing something outdoors or was it to become like a pilot for Southwest airlines? What was that about? Yeah, dude, I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather be set on fire than go work for the majors. I've had a lot of uh, opportunity. People talk to me about it. Um, it just wouldn't interest me. And I explained this to someone yesterday, um, last night on the phone, like I, Used to love to fish. I came up to Alaska. I worked for free uh, on the New Shigak River for a company as the camp bitch, you know, like for free. Dug shitters and just grunt work and trade for equal fishing time. Didn't really get to fish equal amounts. Kind of got screwed over. But I made a couple grand in tips. I was 17 that year. It was between my junior and senior year of high school. And uh, I vividly remember a turbine otter on amphibs come up. That's where the wheels come out of the floats. So you can take off on a runway and go land on a river. And I was just like, dude, that guy is a badass, man. Like, he is what I grew up reading in outdoor life, you know, before mm -hmm. Facebook. And you actually had to read a magazine on the shitter. And uh, it was just crazy. And I went back and I told my parents, I'm like, my next life, I'm going to be one of those bush pilot guys. And they said, no, you can you can still do that. And so I went and I took a $100 flight in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and I was pretty good at it. And then, yeah, parents helped me a lot. I had a lot of credit card debt, sold everything, and then... Nine months later, I had a flight instructor rating, which says I know how to teach people, but I barely know how to fly. And now I'm a pilot. And yeah, through that time, I had spent some time down in Blackfoot trapping for a couple months. That's pretty awesome. You don't hear that a lot where parents will pull you aside when you say your dream. They're like, oh, no, no, you're plenty young. You can still do that. So that's pretty awesome that you had that support from your parents from the jump. Yeah, I wouldn't be where I'm at without my parents supporting that uh, that dream, and it was it was feasible. But I mean, I knew from the start I wanted to fly airplanes and make money. I didn't want to just be a hobby pilot, and I didn't know where it would lead. But I was looking at all the airplanes up there, and I'm like, man, this is this is the real deal. And the guys, I mean, it's still kind of true, but the people up here, like, they're really respected more so than like a doctor because they bring you your groceries, your mail. When your baby's sick, they fly your kid to the hospital. Like it's a valid resource to have out here. And so it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, even where I'm at in Atlanta, Idaho, like I've had to do, you know, helicopter, but life flight before. And I have a neighbor who has his, has a helicopter and he's helped me out a few times in some, you know, hairy situations where, you know, traps are way, way out and snowed in or avalanched in. And we've been able to do some, some work, which is pretty dang cool. But to your point, like it is a resource, especially when you're living extremely remote, which you guys are right now. So you're working towards your commercial license. You're learning how to snare coyotes. Where does the jump to Alaska happen? Because, I mean, you've been in Idaho your whole life. You know, is it a job for 
piloting that takes you up there or is it just kind of that sense of like you know you were up there helping out with fishing and you knew you wanted to be there and just made the jump no so after that first summer i haven't missed a summer in alaska um since they say when it kind of gets its hooks into you it gets into your blood and you can't get it out and that's very true in my case i knew i was destined to live in alaska i just I couldn't, it didn't make sense for me to go full time. And I was going to college and different things like that. Met my wife in North Idaho. We got married. I was kind of flying. I mean, I was a fishing guide and a pilot. And then I was just pretty much a pilot flying to have beavers on floats for high end lodges and stuff. Mm -hmm. I worked a lot over different parts of the state, but primarily Southwest Alaska. There's a lot of sport fishing here and a lot of need for flying. Um, and so, yeah, I did that. And then went to North Dakota for a couple of years, but like we'd fly all summer and then you'd blow all your money in elk season and then you'd be poor and you're living out of a duffel bag. And that's not a way I wanted to live. And I wanted to eventually raise a family. And then a job came up for the federal government for the national park service in King Salmon. And I had been in King Salmon a lot from flying down here. And I knew the area and I knew there was moose and bears and really good fishing. And I just needed an airplane. And so then I got the job, surprisingly, because I'm a white male who's not a veteran. So getting hired by the government, that's not a very good option. And uh, then at that time, I said, OK, I got a couple thousand hours. I'm going to be living in Alaska. Now it makes sense to pull the trigger. And I spent 90 grand on an airplane. I sold my diesel pickup. You know, everyone everyone says, like, it must be nice. Like, I, I never had a good diesel pickup. I had a 2008 6.4 power stroke so i sold that for like 20 grand used that money for a down payment called 50 different banks found a financing place that would finance an experimental airplane financed it and then sold everything else so i could put it towards the airplane because i knew that's all i needed i needed a place to stay in an airplane and i'd figure the rest of it out that's awesome i mean it, it is definitely probable it's clearly a leap of faith when you have to do that but you know, have you always kind of had that clarity of mind of what it is you wanted to do? Or is that just kind of learned over time? What it is meaning what? Like live in Alaska or what? Well, I mean, you seemed to, like you always knew what you wanted to do it was live in Alaska. You knew you needed a plane. So he's like, you know what? I'll sell my truck. I'll find someone to finance it. All I need is a plane. You knew you needed that. And you just dove in and figured it out. And, you know, you might not recognize it. But I'm here as a someone from the outside to say that most people probably have a lot of fear that keeps them from actually jumping in with both feet to be able to pull that off. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just common sense because where we live, like, there's no roads. Like, why do I need a diesel truck? You know, I moved up here with a 1996 Chevy Lumina. I drove that for three years. Piece yeah. of shit car, right? <laughs> I got it. My father-in-law gave it to me. It was like it was a car from probably an oil company and it was bought at a Ritchie brothers auction in Canada, you know, yeah, and, uh, still have it. It's going to, it's a decent car for my kids to drive and stuff and they just go forever. But, um, I did, I knew I didn't need the truck. I knew I definitely needed an airplane. I knew I wanted a super cub and yeah, it just kind of made sense to me. And I guess it was just common sense that I needed all that stuff and to access alaska there's like three roads some of them are really big but there's like there's no access you can't take a four wheeler a lot of places you can't take a truck a lot of places you need an airplane to access where other people can't and where the animals are and so to me that just seems like common sense i still don't know why there's not more pilots in alaska we have a ton of ton of pilots mm -hmm. but why is there not more because it's not hard to figure out to get to where the animals are you're going to pay out your ass to someone else and be reliable on someone else you're going to buy an airplane you're going to learn how to fly it and you're going to do it yourself so yeah i guess when you uh when you say it that way when you think about what some people will uh shell out for hunts in alaska or other you know like bc by the time you do three of those hunts you could probably buy a super cub and start doing it yourself and get longer time out there yeah, I mean, you know, there's just guys that have, I mean, I get the must be nice card a lot. Now I just laugh. And I get guys like, oh, I'm going to buy a cup and I'm going to go moose hunt in Alaska. I'm just like, go ahead, knock yourself out. It's easy. Um, but I mean, they got a $100,000 truck. Their wife's got a $70,000 car. They got a 40, maybe, maybe side by sides are more than 40. I don't know. But I don't, have, I don't have any nice 
stuff. Like I have a junker jet boat, a decent lake boat um, that my wife really wanted to go camp with our kids, a piece of shit four wheeler and like a $4,000 snow machine. You know, I don't have a lot of nice toys. I have a really nice airplane and I have a 2020 F-150. So I've, uh, I've put a lot of emphasis on what I want as the tool to recreate, but, um, it's just all about sacrifices and, you know, the, the people that talk shit and whatever, they don't want to make the sacrifices to live where I do or spend 7,000 hours learning how to fly airplanes, break them, bend them, crash them, and not kill yourself with the high risk of possibly killing yourself to get to where I'm at. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think keyboard warriors are always loud and they usually don't want to put in the same amount of effort. But speaking of recreating, like, when you were doing some trapping in Blackfoot, did you do any trapping while you were in North Dakota too or no? Oh yeah. I tried, but I was working like, I mean, a light week would be a hundred hours. So I'd be checking um, on the way back for some stuff. A lot of freeze thaw. I tried to get into footholds. I've still never put a coyote into a foothold. I've had so many tracks frozen on top of footholds and stuff set on sign. I got Fox and Coon and stuff. A um, couple skunk. But, uh, yeah, I've been pretty effective with snares, but um, I was really trying to get into dirt hole sets there, and it was just, it was tough working, and I don't even remember the trap check law. It was probably every few days or something, but, yeah, always checking traps in the dark. I mean, you guys know, if you have a job, it's like, it's a it's a second full-time job running a line. Oh, yeah, it's uh, the 3 a.m. wake-up calls before, and then in the shed late at night, or in <laughs> depending on how you like to sleep or not sleep, but. Yeah, yeah. So, not the pain. Yeah, so I did some there. I trapped a few bobcats in North Idaho. Uh, tried to run some snares for wolves in North Idaho, and uh, a few coyotes and different things. And that was about it. So then you're in Alaska. You have your cub. You're flying. Is it kind of like relearning how to trap now that you're flying into these places and you're going after wolverine, wolf, like? Talk us through like your experience in Idaho versus Alaska. Like what's the big differentiator other than the ability to get out to some of these places where the animals are? Well, I'll answer your question. I'm going to ask you a clarifying one first. What's like rule number one of trapping? What would you say for all trapping? What's rule number one of trapping? Yeah, you could say, if you could say, if you want to be a successful trapper, do this. Rule number one is what? Oof. Rule number one for me would be... Don't where the animals are. I okay, mean, so set on sign, right? Yeah. Super Cub, fresh snow. It's fucking awesome, dude. I mean, the snow in the winter paints this picture of mm -hmm. what's there, where it's going, where it came from, where the wolf kills are, um, how many there are, what side of the drainage they worked on, what side the prevailing winds are usually coming from. So you learn all this and you take it all in. It tells you a story. That's why I love flying in the winter so much. I love just tracking animals. Um, you can get on wolf tracks. Usually they're going to a kill, depending on how they're working a the drainage. They'll, they don't just go through the timber. They'll kind of walk up on a high bluff and they'll hunt with their eyes and then they'll hmm. go down and they'll spread out. They'll kill a moose. Um, Wolverine will go in near that moose and stuff like that. So you learn where these wolves kill animals um, and you learn where the Wolverine travel. And then I would see all the sign and then I couldn't figure out there's no trap check law in Alaska, which is cool because it would kill people. If you were mandated to trap or check your traps and it's negative 50, people are going to die because stuff just quits working when it's negative 40 and below. Um, and uh, so I wanted to come up with a set that was weatherproof. And I had seen some stuff on Trapper Man, a little bit about people using five-gallon buckets. And I we live in a really windy country. Um, everything loves to eat a beaver. So I trapped some beaver in the fall. Um, I'll freeze it, cut up the chainsaw, drill it with a drill, and then I'll put a piece of like 11 or 14 gauge wire through it and have a bunch of baits pre-baited. And then basically cut a five gallon bucket to hold a Bridger 330. I use all Bridgers, not the best, not the worst, but they kill, they kill Wolverine for me. Um, and I got probably 45 or 50 of those things. So I got quite a few. And, uh, yeah, just, I'd roll up to a set. I'd find out where it was good. And I was... I'm always trying to think of like how to be the most efficient. I think trappers who are efficient and fast is, are really good. Um, but I want to put out like this year I have 
I had 29. Now I have 28. So one of my tree blew. One of my trees blew over. But I want to set two buckets at each spot, usually fairly close together. Sometimes they're only 10 yards apart. And the reason that for that being, if I get like a fox in one or a martin trips one, and there's there's you know the bait's gone. If another wolverine rolls by and I'm not there and I haven't been able to reset it, then I can uh, capitalize on that. Um, Late February into early March, right about now, we get a lot of breeding pairs, so I've doubled up a lot of times. Um, and I've also gotten a couple lynx, a lot of fox. I had a coyote going one last year. I walked up to it, and I'm just like, man, I thought you guys <laughs> – I looked at the thing. I said, I thought you guys were smarter than this. But he ran right up a spruce tree, I mean, six feet up, like get a running start six feet up, dove into the bucket and snapped a 330 on his face. Um, and then I also did that too because I can check him from the air. I don't need to land. He's a lot of lure when I set, and um, I don't land sometimes ever if I don't have to for the rest of the trapping season, um, if it's not sprung or something like that. And if there's a wolverine hanging, I can see it. It's pretty obvious. And uh, also the airflow will keep it out of the mice and different rodents from eating on it, and it'll keep it it suspended. So that's kind of my program for the wolverine, and I – I do quite a bit. This year's been slow, though, dude. I've only got five. Last year, I got, like, 14. Um, it's been weird. I don't know what I got hanging. I'm trying to check tomorrow if this snow breaks. But uh, it really warmed up. And so all the creeks that are becoming Wolverine highways, right, because now they just run the creeks looking for food, those were wide open because it went to 45 degrees when we saw each other at the expo. So now, instead of being set in the best possible place with all the traffic, now the animals are running up high away from my traps and so i was setting on sign and now i'm setting in the worst place so yeah you know well, those things go especially as weather changes but so you, you said something that sounded like it was obvious to you as a pilot but me being a, a freaking land lover i guess like i imagine flying by a set like how low are you to the ground in your super cub to be able to see your you know, Wolverine set six feet up kind of in a tree to be able to tell if it's sprung. Like you said, it's obvious, but I just imagine going so fast. Like, are you able to slow the plane down enough to be able to get a good? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can slow down about 50 or 60 and be plenty comfortable. I mean, the thing lands at 40. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and then if it's blowing, it's always blowing over here. So if it's blowing 20, now you're 60 miles an hour. is only 40 across the ground. Um, and that's 40 this way. If I'm descending, it's 40 this way. And so you actually, you don't travel as fast across the ground. Um, but I'll take a bunch of sticks and tree bows and I'll stick them in the jaws of the trap almost to make it look like a nest. But I'm doing that more so it's a lot easier to see if the trap is sprung, if all that stuff's missing rather than just, oh, I can barely <clears throat> barely see the jaws, you know. And so if there's wolverine hanging out of it, no big deal. If the if there's no bushes or anything stuck in out, sticking out from the sides of the bucket, I know that trap's probably fire, and I need to go in there with some bait and another trap. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. But some are okay. tough because you want to get that bucket up high, but you also kind of want to leave it covered if there's a big canopy of spruce limbs and stuff. So some places I'll, I'll be like four feet off the ground with my skis and just flying right by looking, you know? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, now, wolves – you know, you obviously know the wolf problem we have in Idaho, you know, I'm targeting wolves, you know, a lot of people, you know, are here targeting wolves. What's it like in Alaska? Is it just like extreme numbers that you're having to essentially trap coal, et cetera, or is it kind of slowed down a little bit as more trappers, more hunters have been out that way? Same problem with Idaho. I mean, you guys can kick the shit out of wolves. And I know guys in North Idaho, they, they, they can't even cut a wolf track anymore because they've trapped them all and they're good. But go to the Selway, go to the Frank Church. Like there's wolves that are always going to be there because people aren't going to be there. And same thing with Alaska. Like you can only trap, <clears throat> you can be way more effective with an airplane and cover more ground and look for moose kills and different things like that. Set wolf baits and different things only so far guys usually the snow machine are running a smaller line but you're still closer to some sort of civilization mostly um and yeah like we've trapped a whole pack of wolves before and came back the next year and there's there's more in the same drainage like trap seven there was an eighth one we found dead which is really weird and then the next year there was like 10 or 11 down there and 
just insane. Like, I think it's just the way their territory is. They're always looking to grow and expand. And if there's other wolves in that territory, then they mark their territory a lot, obviously. That'll keep the other dogs out of there. But if there's not, others are going to pull in from other areas, start new packs. And, uh, yeah, I have a ton of respect for wolves. I really like them. They are the smartest animal in North America. They are relentless killers. And I'm going to... I'm trying to get them all, yep. you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a true, it's a true challenge to really, to trap a wolf. And it's really difficult. And I don't use uh, footholds. We do a lot of snares. And the reason I do a killing, a, like a, I use a Marty Seneca setup and the trigger and everything on the snares. Um, a lot of guys don't like that. They say, Hey, it's way too much bullshit. I am friends with Kyler in Canada. The dude traps like 50 wolves a year. And I'm like, if the shit works for him, and he puts a ton of wolves on the ground. Like, I'm just going to use it and trust him. And uh, it's not like there's only one kind of snare that'll kill a wolf. But uh, I want something that's going to kill the animal. For one, so a wolf's not going to chew out. A wolverine's going to pull out of a trap. Um, but I don't want the animal to suffer. Because I'll try and check once a week, once every 10 days. Especially on wolves. I don't want to go in sooner than every 10 days to a set. Because all you're doing, you can't fly by and check snares. You're going in. You know, it's a lot of work to run a bait set a moose kill for wolves um and all that stuff but so real, quick, real quick right there just out of curiosity so when you are flying in to check wolf traps like snares are you flying your cub in somewhere landing it and then like snowshoeing in yeah we're at? Okay. yeah and a lot of times you can only land so close half mile mile away um you're snowshoeing in which is hard because snowshoes don't look like moose tracks I've tried to go without snowshoes. Have you ever tried to walk in belly button deep snow? Like you go five yards and you're tapped. Like you just, you, you have to put snowshoes on. Mm -hmm. And so at that point you're trying to approach from the side and stuff, but there's just a ton of work that goes into it. I've set out caribou carcasses before, you know, trimmed all the meat off caribou and flown it into somewhere and just dropped it on a gravel bar and just really, really thick stuff and snared wolves that way. I've snared them going in back into moose kills and stuff. Um, it's weird though. They'll kill a caribou. They'll hardly eat any of it. Sometimes they'll leave and they'll, they won't return to a caribou, but I've seen them come back the next year to chew on the bones of the moose they killed the previous winter. So hmm. I don't know if it's the taste of moose or if it's the, maybe a risk factor that, I mean, a moose can kill a wolf. I've got wolves before that have the whole skull crushed in from a moose hoof. I'm presuming, um, and a single wolf can kill a caribou. I've seen it. I've tracked him down and seen it. Um, so I don't know what it is, but they love eating moose. And they are they're good at killing, dude. Like, they are very good at killing. Yeah, uh, it is impressive to watch. Like, even the past few years where I'm at, where we have now about four or five packs running around, like, the instances of just kills, and not even fully eaten half the time, just killed, left run on to the next elk or in our case occasionally a moose we don't have big numbers down where yeah. i'm at but it's impressive yeah and i used to say that like growing up in idaho oh wolves just kill everything and leave it like they do sometimes but i also like in the caribou case i, I have never seen them come back um but uh yeah i wonder if it's they're doing that and they're only eating a little bit because they're gonna they're gonna make a loop and come back but i've also seen wolves they'll kill a moose They'll eat it. They'll go 500 yards away, lay up on the hillside, kind of digest it. And they'll stay within a couple miles of that moose for a week. And the pack of eight wolves will just hammer it. They'll eat the whole thing in a week. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. So with all your trapping experience and this being a trapping podcast, I'm curious. Do you think that spending so much time trapping just kind of throughout your life has made you a better hunter? And if uh, so, what about trapping has made you a better hunter? And if the answer is no, the answer is no. But um, curious your thoughts on that. I would say, yeah, for sure. Just the first thing that comes to mind is the ability to read sign. When you're a hunter, it's kind of like never bow hunting before, right? In your first year of bow hunting, you become, you, you don't kill anything, but you become 10 times better of a hunter than you were as a rifle hunter because you have to get close to the pursuit and, you know, you have to actually read the wind and know what the wind's doing. When you're a trapper to be successful, you have to be able to read sign. So like I'll track wolf tracks, I'll go to a moose kill, I'll go in there and I'll set it. And then 10 days later, I'll go in, there'll be fresh snow. And I have to go read exactly what these wolves did and tell a story and how they, 
you know, pissed on my trap over here and stuck their nose through this snare. I mean, I've literally had them walk up to a snare, stick their face through it, back up, turn around and leave. And I'm just like, dude, talk about depression, you know, um, very frustrating. And so you have to read all that and basically build this movie in your brain about what happened, how to fix it, how to mitigate, how to now they're smart because they know you were there and they saw the snare. Now we have to go back 300 yards where they did walk, but not walk on their trail, walk to the side, intercept it, and hang a snare into the trail with no scent and mitigate all your scent. And you have to do all that. So I think being that observant helps you in a hunting situation because you learn the animal movements and, hey, that wasn't there before, or just reading little bits of sign like, hey, this alder was snapped over right here and I didn't see that before. Little things like that, I think, all add up to helping in the field. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And then on the depression note, I actually had that happen to me last week where I was out doing some beaver trapping kind of in one of the, the wilderness areas up by me and can only snowshoe in. It was a no motorized area. And it, same thing. I had a snare up and I had a wolf walk right up to that snare, you know, probably had his nose in it, backed up and went around. And that can uh, lead to some sleepless nights for sure. It's about the most depressing thing you can have happen as a trapper. Yeah, Maybe exactly. other than that, other than like a wolf, like chew out of a snare or something like when you actually had him. But yeah, they're, they're, they're so smart, dude. It's really hard. It makes looking like a Wolverine or a Bobcat. They're, they're freaking dumb. Lynx, they're dumb. Canines like coyotes are really smart, but wolves are too at next level. Yeah. They're, they're way smarter than me is what I keep finding out. But you know, I know that you are a very humble person, but I saw with my own eyes at the hunt expo uh, when we met up, there were actually some young kids, you know, probably 14, 17 years old, somewhere in that age range who uh, obviously follow you on social media, look up to what you're doing, you know, whether that's hunting, trapping, flying, you know, to the point where one of them had made you a, a leather uh, dick bone sheath, uh, which was pretty awesome. But a lot of what this podcast is focused on is, you know, new hunters or people who are getting into trapping and hunting later in life. So if you can think on it, what would be a piece of advice you would give to somebody who's curious about getting into trapping? Man, I would try and find a mentor. I would try and find an old timer, someone who's got a line or something like that. I really didn't have one. I went with a guy one time who was like an uncle to a girl I dated in North Idaho when I was really young, like 18, 19. That's pretty much it. Everything else, um, I just learned the hard way, trial and error, you know? Like I used to use a regular uh, snare, just one you'd buy from like snare shop for coyotes. And uh, I spray painted them a little bit, you know, and then hung them outside. And uh, they blended in super well. And I got a coyote, but I set the loop too big. I set a loop at like 13, 14 inches, and I got a head and an arm. Nice. And uh, just like, just like you know, you can't choke someone out really with a head and an arm. You get just a neck, it's good night. And uh, this coyote chewed out. And so I said, I was so pissed. So I went to a kill spring, just the inline one you put on. For like 25 pounds and uh, man i was killing everything they were dead as a doornail and they came up wrapped around tight and just i mean the snare was like tiny right and i loved it and you can do that in idaho it's illegal some states you can't use a dispatch snare and i caught that coyote three weeks later and had my spray painted snare you know cut into the fur and he had chewed out of it and i just i was so happy with that that's one of the very few successes you get as a trapper. There's a lot of failure in different things. Like we talked about the wolves, but when it does come together, it's pretty cool. So I try and find a mentor or just get out and start doing it, you know, but I do tell people like, I don't put link sets out. Like a lot of guys will build a cubby like you would for a bobcat and put a link mm -hmm. snare pen in there. Links are dumb. They're easy to catch. I haven't seen a links track all winter, you mm -hmm. know? So like, don't try and catch cats. If there's no cats in your area, we have wolves and wolverines. So that's why I try and catch. I usually get a couple Martin, but I don't set sets for Martin. I get them as incidentals and then I get some Fox, but it's like trap what you have. You know, if you have a lot of Fox in your area, trap Fox. If you have a lot of muskrat and beaver, go for that stuff, you know, but don't try and make something happen um, that you don't have the sign that's there, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's probably better universal advice too, because people are going to be listening from all over the U S or yeah. wherever they're at and, you know, trap for what you've got in the area and what's sustainable. 
Um, yeah, utilize your resource too. If you know someone or a family friend or someone has any kind of connection, like put feelers out, who's got land I can trap? Because in Alaska, it's a lot of it's public land and a lot of it doesn't see human presence. So in that case, it's almost like private. These animals don't see pressure. But for guys like back east, if you can find someone that's got some swamp land or a guy that's got a whitetail lease and you can you can trap coyotes off and stuff and you can get off the public and you can get onto private where there's going to be more animals and probably a better density and probably animals who haven't been pressured as much as public land and been educated by public land trappers. You know, all the dumbasses like us that started out and got all these coyotes wised up. That's going to be a huge bonus for you because you're going to be able to be more successful. And when you get those little successes, it encourages you to keep going, you know? Yeah, they definitely snowball. Um, and for someone like me, too, who didn't have a mentor, kind of learned on my own, I had a lot of failures that weren't leading to a successful snowball. And if I could go back and redo it, I'd probably take the advice you just gave and find somebody, maybe find some private land to help people out on. Um, you know, yeah. another thing I was curious about, Adam, and I'm a relatively new dad. I know you're a father. How has being a father and having kids around changed your approach? I'm going to ask for trapping, but it could go for hunting too. Um, overall, I still need to take my little seven year old trapping. It's just, it's been cold and it's been like, I'm looking for like the perfect day to go. You know, I want to make it a fun experience. Um, she just skinned a mink with me the other day. I mean, I almost, yeah, it was tiny little mink that I caught um, next to the open water, of course, you know, and caught it in a 3.30 miraculously. And uh, she loves to go um, and experience stuff. I'm going to, like, bring hot chocolate and candy and stuff. But it's a full day. Like, it's a lot. Checking the Super Cub. And it'd be fun to go and put her on snowshoes and hike in there. But it's just been so brutally cold. I mean, five degrees and blowing 30 is not what you want to take a seven-year-old girl in to do. So I'm waiting for a better time to do that. I've done a lot of beaver trapping my kids, even through the ice in the fall, to get bait and stuff. Um, but it's fun. And uh, I guess I've, I've experienced more in the hunting side with them. Like my kids, they'll help on the uh, putting up fur. And like I give all the foxes to my kids. I hate skinning fox. They're way too thin. And yeah, I would screw them up. So I'm just like, here, you guys screw them up. I don't care which, whatever you want to do with them. And it's fun. It's good learning for them. And uh, yeah, I do a lot of hunting with my kids. It's it's probably, probably one of the coolest things you can do just because uh, I love hunting and I love my kids and to bring that together and to see them immersed into a world they really don't know a lot about and stuff we take for granted. Like we'll go and like my kids will be looking at seashells, you know, down on the ocean or they'll be looking at flowers, all the stuff you and I walk right by. They, uh, Oh dad, check this out. You look at this fossil. And I'm like, I could give a shit about a fossil, but it's really cool to see my kids take it all in. And, uh, yeah, I really like it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I I've only done some beaver trapping with my daughter and she's very young. You know, she's, going to be three soon so we get her in little waiters and she's got the attention span of a gnat but you know when she's immersed in it she's happy and same thing pointing stuff out but yep. that's cool and then i did see the moose hunting video with one of your kids that was just pretty freaking awesome was that uh is that on stuck in the rut yeah so stuck in the rut youtube we i kind of married into that it was my wife's family and uh yeah, I guess got a lot of people that watch it. I got like 250,000 subscribers on there, which is pretty cool. Um, for one of the things I make money off YouTube, I don't. Uh, there's no money to be made really in the hunting industry. Just like people think like this is your career having a trapping podcast. And it's like, no, I, I lose money with all the shit I have to buy. Um, but uh, it's fun and it's cool. We watched my daughter's brown bear hunt. So my oldest daughter, Julia, wanted to shoot a moose. Long story short, I took her out, and to be legal in Alaska, moose must be 50 inches. They have, like, trophy minimums and stuff. And uh, I was looking for a 50-inch moose. Um, definitely underjudged the one she shot. It was in velvet, and they're hard to judge in velvet. It was a late year. Moose held development, like, three weeks longer. Um, I knew it was a big moose. I knew it was probably a book moose, and we did a four-mile stock when I learned shot it, and it was one of the largest moose I've ever seen. It was scored 254, gross. Like the world record's like 260 something. And for a 15 year old girl to shoot that 338 Ultra Mag, I was like, man, 
freaking cool. And a lot of guys, I think we talked about this at the expo. He sat down a little bit like, oh, man, that's that's so cool. You didn't grab the gun. I'm like, dude, how could you ever look yourself in the mirror as a coward of a dad? If I would have picked up the gun and say, no, honey, this is the biggest moose I've ever seen. I'm dropping him. I had a tag. Mm-hmm. I could have done that. Um, but I mean, I'm not a piece of shit dad. And that's what a piece of shit dad would do. Um, and I was in that situation when I was younger on a, at the first buck I ever shot, I was a 31 inch mule deer and my dad could easily picked up his gun and rolled it. And I missed it and it got away. I mean, it was 31 inches. It laid way out. Widest mule deer I've ever seen. And, uh, buck fever is a fat little 12 year old. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I don't know how you could as a father take your kid hunting and then see an animal that's a world-class animal. Probably, I mean, my biggest moose is 231 and I've killed a lot of big moose and I see a lot of big moose. I may never shoot a moose that big and I'm totally fine with it. And I'd, I'd way rather have my kid be the rock star than me. Like I'd way rather have my wife be the rock star than me. Like I don't freaking care, dude. You know? Yeah. I, like you said, that's a sign of a great dad of just somebody we're out there for them to have the experience and we want them to probably feel the same things that we've felt on different hunts or different trap lines. And that becomes way more important than anything else. So yeah. It, yeah. And it was just cool. I told my, got home and told my daughter, I said, man, it was pretty crazy. I said, I was pretty popular at the expo. And she's like, were you? And I said, yeah, I had a couple people want to meet me and like guy gave me this dick bone thing. And one kid wanted my autograph on his dick bone shirt. And I said, there's one person there more, uh, more popular. And she's like, was it mom? And I said, no. And I said, actually, a person wasn't there. I said, who was it? And I said, you. And they mm-hmm. said, why me? And I said, because everyone wanted to meet the 15-year-old who shot a giant world record type moose, walked up to it with a lollipop in her mouth and put two more shots into it to kill it. Like, that is, that's badass. And she's like, really, Dad? I'm like, yeah. I said, you were the talk of the expo. So I'd rather, way rather have it be on her. I don't want the spotlight. It's kind of nice not having the spotlight on me anymore. And, uh have my kids be the killer. That's awesome. Well, you know, we were talking a little bit about getting help with kids in the first year. So one question I always ask guests, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made on your trap line and the biggest mistake you've ever made in the first shed? Biggest mistake on the trap line. Um, It's going to be different. I was set in a spot. um, Imagine a Creek, right? Timber spruce. And then you have, you know, 200 yard wide gap. And then there's a little cut bank bluff that goes up hundred feet and there was good snow in here. So I drug my skis through it and you're checking for overflow for people who don't know what that is. That's water underneath snow. So it's five degrees out, but underneath the snow, there's slush, there's water, there's beaver pond. There's something that's not frozen. That snow is insulating. It. It's a weird phenomenon. Um, drug my skis over and I'm like, man, it looks pretty good. Took off, looked at it. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. I rushed the procedure, right? Usually screwing up flying, you rush something. Came back in, I landed and I stopped. I looked down and I see water coming up around my skis and skis are like six foot long snowboards. Right. And so I pan it and I'm like, no, we need to go. And the plane just stuck. Right. And like, so now it's five degrees. All this water that I've uninsulated is now freezing in the ice balls around my skis holding me here. So I kind of start panicking. I jump out. I grab my axe, grab my snowshoes, run over a spruce tree, start cutting off spruce bows and uh, bringing them back. And I've been stuck in a pickup hundreds of times growing up in North Idaho. So I knew I had to get this thing shoveled out. So I took my shovel and I kind of went in the side of each ski and got as much as I could out. And then I took the spruce boughs and tried to put them under the front. I go up to the wing and rock it. And I tried to do this and uh, started a few times and couldn't get it to go. And the last time I had Pretty much was sitting on a small, thin layer of icy slush. Most of the other crap was gone. I had some spruce bows to kind of climb up onto a ramp, and I got in. I pinned it, and I was just working the stick and the rudder and the flaps. Just barely got it moving. My feet aren't even in the airplane. They're hanging out. It starts to get moving a couple miles an hour. Uh, but now you get all this ice and stuff on the bottom of the skis, so you even created a lot of drag. And uh, GTFO, dude, I got the F out of there. And uh, next place I landed was like, on a grade with spruce trees on both sides and so i'm like there's no water here and i drug it like three times and yeah was not great uh so that's probably the biggest mistake i've ever had was just getting myself into a situation like that where if it would have been much worse like i don't know how you fix it you pretty much have to go cut three logs build a tripod Mm -hmm. put the tripod over the airplane engine and winch the airplane up 
put logs underneath the airplane to build yourself a ramp, let it set overnight and then fly out the next day. Like that sounds horrible. Um, so then I fly back. I'm in my buddy's hangar. It's not heated, but uh, it had been like 35, 40 degrees, had ice everywhere. I figured it all melted off, uh, went to go set wolf snares the next couple days later, got in my airplane, had the heater, closed the door. The Super Cub is just a real simple airplane. It's got a clamshell door that comes together and there's just a, a lever and two pins that lock into the front and rear to engage the door. Land at my wolf snare. And I go to get out and the freaking door's shut. Like it's frozen shut from all the ice and everything I had kicked up. It got in that mechanism into the ports. <clears throat> so now I'm stuck in my airplane. I can't get out. Like I could have taken off. But it's like, dude, I kind of need to get out of this thing. And so I flip open the left window, which is probably like 24 inches wide, 18 inches tall. I'm 6'2", 260 without winter gear on and bunny boots. And somehow I sneak through that climb down without damage to the airplane, get out my MSR stove. It's basically hooked to a piece of orange scat tubing, four inches. I start the stove. It runs on ab gas. I take the tube and I melt the whole door. I open it. I grab some warm engine oil. I put warm engine oil over every moving part, close the door, make sure it works and say, fuck this. And I go home. And no wolf. I didn't even set one trap. I was so pissed. And like the last two, last two times I had been, I hadn't put any gear out. It's just been one failure after another. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, that's pretty difficult. Um, probably a little different than like a normal trap line failure, but just just me, the access to get out there is the hard part. Once I'm at the area, I can set the gear and work it um, just fine. And then fur shed, uh, I've got a couple wolves. Wolves take. I'm probably down to four or five hours. It used to take me about eight hours to a wolf. It took me a couple hours to skin and then feet, ears, lips, full taxidermy prep. So I would skin them. I'd roll them up face first into a bag, garbage bag, and then freeze it, right? And a lot of guys say don't do that. I've never had one go bad that way. I put the face in first because I don't want that to freeze or burn or anything. Um, I'll put all the air into it and then I'll spin it and I'll tie in a knot. I just had a Wolverine today. If you tie that knot too low, part of the tail will get in there. One time I cut off the knot. I'm like, oh, it's fine. Well, the tail came out instead of coming to a nice point like this. It had the last two inches just bowl cut, like uh -huh. perfectly straight. I'm like, well, shit, no one's going to buy that now. <laughs> so then I used that to make some garments for myself. Um, that was a bad first shed one. But the worst is I pulled a wolf out. I hung the trash, I just threw the trash bag on the garage floor like a dumbass, right? And I was like, oh, just let that wolf thaw out. Well, then the next day, I was like, oh, it's good weather. I'm going to go fly. Let me put it in the fridge. And I went cold, hot, semi-cold fridge, pulled it out, hung it up, fleshing it. And I'm like, oh, this looks kind of weird. And the backside had about, I don't know, six inches by 12 inches just right down the back uh, slipped out. So now what I do... As I roll the wolves up the same way, I take the back foot and I run a piece of paracord on it. And I put that right on the top of the bag and I don't tie the bag where it gets the tail in it. And so I open the bag, like I just did these wolverines. I grab the piece of parachute cord, I hang it. Now they're hung from the back foot. As they warm up, gravity is going to help you unroll the whole hide. If I'm really concerned, I'll put a fan on them overnight, but I'll do that before I go to bed. And the next morning, the fur is ready to go and I can start pulling the feet and doing everything without anything slipping. But don't be a dumbass and leave it in the bag. Yeah, I've I've been there, and it's. <laughs> I feel like there's it only so retarded, right? Yeah, that's how I feel ninety nine percent of the time. But you know, trapping's great, right? But I feel like all we talk about is the depression, you know, the feeling like an idiot half the time because that's ninety nine percent of the experience with probably a one percent of like awesome you know, experiences that go along with it. Yeah, but it's the same thing. Like if it was easy, everyone would do it, you know? Yeah. And one of the coolest thing is, is like walking up to a wolf on a trap and it's like, I need to call help. I need someone to bring in a bigger set of snowshoes because I'm not going to be able to drag these giant brass balls out of here because no. I'm, I'm the freaking man, dude. You're looking around like, is anyone looking at this? Like I'm the man. I yeah. caught the world's smartest predator who's a killing machine and I did it with my knowledge in his backyard. Like you feel like a freaking stud. So when that happens, it's like all the failure makes up for it. You know? Yeah, it definitely outweighs it. So all that time on your trap lines, another question I always ask guests is, 
do you have like the weirdest experience you've ever had out in the woods? You know, some people go the paranormal route. Some people go Sasquatch. Some people just have, you know, mundane stuff. But what's the weirdest thing you've ever experienced in the woods? Um, <clears throat> I did pick up 10 Wolverine in a trap check one time. That was pretty good. Um, that was, I set, and I don't set like all winter because I don't have the time and the fuel and the, the daylight in Alaska is really limited. If you start setting like November 10th when it opens, I'll usually start in January and set hard for like six weeks. Um, and I had set and the weather was just so nasty. I tried to leave. The airplane is picking up ice and I had to check a couple weeks later and I had like 10 Wolverine and I, I set, I couldn't check at all. And then I, I was running out of snow and I pulled my line. And I had 10 Wolverine. It was crazy. Um, but no, probably just the other day. I've never had any weird stuff. Don't believe in Sasquatch or paranormal stuff. Um, the uh, the other day I went to a set and I flew by and I could only see one of my buckets. It didn't have anything in it and I couldn't find the other one. So I landed and I walked over there and I'm like, dude, I, I know I made a video of this. So like I made a video and like made a real for Instagram. I'm like setting this set a couple years ago. I was trying to find it. I'm looking at the tree. I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, dude, it looks like the same tree. And I'm sitting there talking to myself like a dumbass. I'm like, dude, there's no one here. There's no snow machine tracks. I'm 150 miles from the nearest house. Uh, like, you can't unclip a 330 from with a carabiner. And I'm just like, where is my shit? Like, a bear come through and rip the bucket off. That makes sense. But, like, where's the trap? And then finally, after, like, 15 minutes of sitting there talking to myself, I look to the right, and I can just barely see about this much of the jaws sticking out of a snowdrift. So the wind came through. Oh, I set I set on a dead tree that was kind of leaning, and it was on its last leg, and the wind blew it over. And then the trap filled in. You know, it was still set, but I went over there and just knocked it out and fired it with my axe and pulled that trap out of there. So that's the one I had. I had 29 sets, but that one's 28. Um, but, yeah, that was weird. I was like – I was like, someone must have taken this, but who? There's no sign. I've never seen any sign out here besides animal, and I've flown it for the last six years. Um, so that was probably the craziest thing that's happened to me, which is not very crazy. Well, I think if I had to make a film for trapping, I think capturing that moment where every trapper knows this, where you go up to something and something's gone, and you have a little bit of excitement that maybe you've caught something. Yeah. Or the fact that you just are so confused as to what happened and you're trying to play like Rain Man in your head at what's going on. And that blank look of trappers would be a pretty cool video just over each other, you know, over and over again, because that's half the battle, too. Just like what happened and where is my shit? Yeah, but that's that's part of being a good trapper is you now have to figure it out. Like if you're on a drag, OK, and then it snowed. OK, where which way would he have gone? You know, where's the brush pushed down where the drag probably went through and different things like that. Um, like I said, with snow, like it tells a story. You get to see it. A lot of times on my traps, though, like I'll check, you know, once every 10 days. If it snowed since then, I don't get to see the refusals and the sign and see how Wolverine works his set. I did have one. There's There's been stories and Wolverine are like a big menace if they figure it out, you know. And so I'll do a trap. I'll cut all the sticks off a tree, either a leaning tree or a vertical spruce tree, so we can't stand there and be comfortable and then go into the trap. But I had one that was like grabbing the jaws and the springs and ripping them out and then going to eat the bait. And I think I eventually caught him. But if I do have refusals, I don't really get to see it because if there's any, even a skip of snow or that snow blows away, <clears throat> I'm not able to see how that animal worked the set. So usually I just go up and I have fur hanging and I pull them out. I'll reset it. I'll put a bunch of gusto on and I'll take back off, you know, but I'm getting pretty close. Like we can trap, um, part of my area just shut down and then some of it op stays open until the end of March. But, uh, a lot of people don't know Wolverine females have a delayed implantation of the uterus. We might've talked about this, like their, their body will easily be able to abort a fetus and it won't like fully implant till she gets fully pregnant. Um, if they don't secure a food source. So she kind of like get knocked up. They mate in their mating season now. And now their body's kind of sitting in limbo. And she's like, I need to find a food source. So she needs to go find a wolf kill, pull a moose quarter off of it, cache it somewhere where the birds aren't going to get to it. And then her body's going to say, okay, now I'm secure. Now I'm going to have a litter, which is pretty neat. I was going to say, no, we, we did not talk about that. And that's probably one of the cooler, you know, pieces of, information i had no idea existed yeah so 
pretty cool system God set up there with the Wolverine, but uh, they'll do that and have the ability to abort. Um, so I just don't want to be that guy where I get like a partially wet female or something like that. I catch a few females, as you know, 330s don't discriminate. Um, they'll kill whatever sticks their face in there. Um, but yeah, like I said, I got five now. I'm assuming I have a couple more hanging. Um, and it's been a weird year. I don't know if I've get, I'm getting to the point where I've really started to need to like pull out of some traps, but I've also talked to guys locally and they're like, we just haven't seen a lot of fur moving around this year. Like it's weird. And I haven't seen a whole lot of sign either, but last year there was tons of sign. Even after I pulled traps, there was tons of sign. And now I'm just like not seeing it. So I don't know what's going on. Um, but like I said, that's part of the game, figuring it out. And I also want to be proactive too. I don't want to like, I'm not just trapping one drainage. I'm trapping like 13. So it's not like I'm just going to take out all the fur, but I am going to try to be as proactive as I can. If I'm not seeing sign in this drainage and I'm not catching more fur, I'm, I move some stuff this year. I wouldn't set there and I'm probably going to make some moves next year to different country, or I might just give Wolverine a year off because it's a shitload of work, dude. And uh, give them a year off and just kind of focus on wolves that would take a ton of time, but uh, give the Wolverines maybe a chance to bounce back a little bit if I did hammer them too hard. But I really don't think I did. They have such a huge range, and I trap so much country that, you know, if I'm getting 14 Wolverine, that's essentially one from each drainage. Mm. That's are, it. are Wolverine – I've never skinned a Wolverine or trapped one myself. Now, Badger, yes – and they're a pain to skin, especially the females when you're having to cut around nipples. Is it the same thing with a, a Wolverine? Yeah, the females don't have bad nipples now, but later in the season they'll get some. But, um, yeah, they're just like a badger, like a mini grizzly bear. They're just – they're tough. Everything about them is hard just to just to cut their joints, to skin them, to flush them. They're just – they're tough, but, uh, I've gotten pretty good. I mean, should have done like 50 of them or whatever. So I'm getting pretty fast now. Um, and yeah, I sell all my stuff on Instagram. I don't take any of it to, uh, I would, I still lose money selling on Instagram and I sell it for a pretty good price. But, uh, yeah, if I went to auction, I would freaking lose a shitload of money, you know, yep. but how they go. But I know we're running up on time. So I do have one last question. I always do a hypothetical with guests. Oh so man. Yeah, I came up with one for you. Uh, I might know the answer already based on some of the conversation, but would you rather keep your plane but only be able to do maintenance on it outside and in your underwear? That includes wintertime. Or give up the plane and only be able to run your trap line by snow machine, but you get to wear warm clothes in that scenario. And this is for the rest of your life. So I get to keep the cub mm -hmm. and I get to work on it even in the winter in my underwear. And it has to be outside. So you're not in like a warm hangar or anything. You are Ugh. outside of the elements. I built a freaking out. half million dollar hangar. It's still not even finished right now. And yeah, yeah, that's pretty depressing. Or I run snow go and I get to be warm. Yep. Well, as warm as you can be, you know, wearing normal snow gear. I would probably do 30 seconds at a time in and out of the pickup and I'd go out there in my underwear and I would get, I would get it figured out. <laughs> just, the ability to, um, there's no fur like where I live. Like I don't set any traps close to home because guess what? There's not any sign. Mm -hmm. And so where guys trap here, there's like, you get this 20 miles. Okay, Zach, he's my neighbor. He gets this 20 miles. Why do I want to trap next to you? Mm -hmm. Why well, don't want to trap any animal that's ever seen any of your scent, your bait, your anything. Like I want to go out where the animals are dumb, where there's more of them, where I don't see any people, where there's no tracks and I can set and do whatever I want in the middle of nowhere. And I'm relying on myself. And so I think I'd probably take that, but it sounds freaking cold. <laughs> yes. It'd be for tough winters when the trapping season's going on, but I figured that might be your answer. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't say like, yeah, I don't know. I've gotten a lot of bullshit from the, the airplane. Like, oh, it must be nice. You just see a moose, you land, you shoot it the next day. I'm like, man, I'd have a lot of 80-inch moose if that happened, you know, because I've mm -hmm. seen some 80s and I just they don't, don't work out that way. Um, what I tell people, the airplane, yeah, I would be nowhere nearly as successful without the airplane. Um, I had some guy, 
I made some trapping posts the other day. He's like, you wouldn't have that airplane 100 years ago. I'm like, dude, I think you missed the point. Like, I would probably catch more fur 100 years ago just running on a dog team because there was a lot of a lot of animals, mm-hmm. not a lot of trapping. Um, but uh, airplanes very successful, but it just allows you the access to get to where the animals are. And for trapping, like, like we've said, set on sign, that's rule number one, you know? So, like, if you see tracks going through a drainage, the primary wind is coming from the north, and you set on the north side of that drainage where it confluences to a creek, and you put a shitload of gusto, and you put a piece of beaver in there, say goodnight, dude. Like, it's going to happen. Yep. Well, that's awesome. There's a lot of sage advice here for folks listening. Adam, I, I want to thank you for coming on, chatting with me. And you know, for you, where can people find more about you? Like what your social media, if people wanted to buy a Wolverine or potentially buy a wolf pelt from you, you mentioned that's all through Instagram. So are, is there anything you'd like to plug? I know <laughs> your wife's got some stuff coming up too with you know a, a female get together. So anything you want to plug, I'd, I'd welcome that here. Uh, yeah, my wife's doing an all women's retreat, a big one down in Idaho, I think close to you uh, in June. Um, a lot of trapping stuff involved there, how to put up fur, shooting, hunting, wilderness survival, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and then hers is Tana Sue Fit. Mine's just Grenda89 on Instagram. I saw all my stuff through there. A lot of comedy, satire stuff. Uh, don't get offended. It's just Instagram. It's all fake and make-believe. Like, this is way more real. Um, the only good thing that comes out of Instagram is selling a few hides and, like, meeting people like you. Um, that's about it. Everyone takes it way too seriously. And I, I try to show a lot of the negative stuff too. Like, Oh look, didn't catch anything trapping today because like, that's the real deal. Everyone just shows the highlights of their life. I'm like, no, there's a lot of sucky parts to life too that I want to showcase. Um, but yeah, that, and then stuck in the road on YouTube, any of the hunting stuff on there. I don't put a lot of trapping on there just cause it's so much work filming that if I'm already trapping and running out of time and running out of daylight, that's the hard part of an airplane. Like you only have so much time to get what's done in a day when you have this amount of this window. Like I don't have time to film it. Yeah. I feel you there. I I've toyed with that on my trap line and I don't have to deal with the smaller days like you do up in Alaska, but everything that just adds on is just such a pain. Um, and when you're already doing something hard, it's really difficult to get the motivation to, to do a little more. So that's why I do respect some guys like Paul Antak and other guys who are out there filming their trap. And that is a next level commitment that I just haven't quite gotten to yet. It's tough. Yeah. Really tough. Cool. Well, the Dick bone King, everybody go follow him. You know, you'll learn a lot and uh, appreciate you coming on Adam. Thanks for having me. Dude. I'll do it again. I love talking about trapping. Yeah, we'll do it. All right, everybody. We'll catch you next time.